Okay, let's bring in Jenny Horn for a look at some stock movers this morning. T Jenny, thanks so much for joining the show. Good morning. Tesla third quarter deliveries just released, and I'm taking a look at shares. Uh, we still obviously have a little bit of go to go before the opening bell, but uh, pointing to, uh, to a, a lower open on these numbers, and they look in line, if not higher than expected. So fill us in here. I know, and Caroline, I think this is interesting because it depends on what metrics you look at. Because I was reading the street was expecting around 462,000 deliveries in the third quarter. Some metrics I'm seeing now call for more roughly like 463,000, which then total deliveries did come in around 463,897,000. Mm -hmm. So depending on what metric you could look at, you would say that it came just slightly maybe above expectations. But all in all, I mean, that's a beat. Other models delivered in the third quarter totaled just shy of 23,000 versus estimates of around 26,000. Their thir third quarter Model 3 and Y deliveries were roughly 440,000 versus estimates of 436,000. Third quarter production, though, this was a pretty major number. Came in around 469, roughly 470,000 vehicles versus estimates of 466,000, roughly. Other models produced during the quarter totaled around 26,000 versus the 17,000 expected. So production is a solid beat. Mind you, they really only have about one month of inventory. So I do think that this is seen as, as still a win, but you can find obviously the areas of weakness, why shares are down about a percent here in real time and reaction because the headline figure would have it being a miss. Now, again, according to various metrics, I'm seeing it as a beat, but Roughly 463,000, 464,000 vehicles delivered in the third quarter. I mean, that's a solid number. And a huge focus for why Tesla has been so volatile this year is a lot of its third quarter deliveries. So I think we are right now paying more attention to this delivery figure than unfortunately the production figure, which was stronger. Yeah, and, and I think it's also important to note that Tesla shares have had this huge run higher really since the beginning of August. So potentially uh, it could be a sign that the, the delivery number is already priced in. We, of course, have the RoboTaxi event on the 10th, though. So uh, should we be looking at that as really the key catalyst and uh, maybe set aside the delivery numbers or what? Well, I was reading a very optimistic note out of Wedbush's Dan Ives, I believe it was yesterday, that highlighted the RoboTaxi event as like the next major catalyst for shares. And of course, Ives is very enthusiastic enthusiastic about the RoboTaxi event and some of the FSD technology that we're expecting to get, as well as AI offerings. And I will say to his credit, anytime we hear more and more about AI and the way this company is already deploying AI, I, I think that that's seen as a win. But I just had to hold my breath because this RoboTaxi event has been delayed and now I just am skeptical about what it will actually entail because we've been talking about FSD for years at this point. So I understand the impatience. And of course, Ives does have the street high price target on this name still. but. Tesla's been on a pretty nice run, a recovery run at that. But at this point now, looking at about a 4% year-to-date gain off of its highs by almost 5%. So it's been a nice recovery story. But the question now is, can they maintain this momentum once we get those that RoboTax event on October 10th? Yeah, because I think a lot of the gains that we've been seeing have really been attributed to uh, optimism about that event. All right, let's switch gears over to Nike, seeing a big sell-off after earnings. Uh, failed to impress with this one, pushed out the guidance. Uh, tell us what's weighing on shares. And I, I knew it wasn't good, frankly, when I saw Nike withdraws its guidance and also postpones its investor event due to the CEO, CEO transition. I mean, that's never exactly the headline story you want as the takeaway from your earnings event, naturally. They did post double-digit revenue declines, and management said that a comeback of this scale takes time and a return to growth could start to justify their multiple, which many analysts actually say looks pretty unlikely that we won't see this recovery really until the first half of 2026 at the earliest. But for reference, the guidance issued during their latest earnings report did, or back in June, did call for their fiscal 2025 revenue to be down in the mid-single digits, with the first half down in high single digits. The company did say it expects its now fiscal second quarter revenue to be down around 8 to 10 percent in that range on a year-over-year -year basis. Gross margins are seen falling around 150 basis points during the current quarter, 
Well, revenue expectations have overall moderated. I think that when you look at each individual component, it speaks to some of this weakness. Like North America sales declined 11% year over year. That was actually largely in line and direct trends are getting worse as well. So that's not encouraging. They did report its 12% decline in their direct sales and a 20% drop in Nike Digital, which shows that a lot of these competing brands are successfully taking over some of the market share of this space. Nike did sound even more cautious when it gave guidance on some of its specific markets like U.S. and China. German rival Adidas was very upbeat about its presence overseas, so that's not exactly the contrast you want either. But Nike is facing right now very difficult, I'd say, competition. We talk about these various brands like On, Deckers, of course, with Hoka, and there's several others. I mean, Lululemon now has its own shoe brand as well. So I just think we're going to see different earnings periods for Nike than we have in the past. I mean, this was seen as like the leader of athleisure. I don't really know if that's been the tone now for several straight earnings quarters. Yeah, and I, I, we're going to talk about this one later in the show and some of the competition. So we'll break down these numbers a little bit more. Uh, what is the analyst community saying about this report? Obviously, it was a top line miss. Yeah. Can't say much about the guidance for the full year, seeing as they, they uh, you know, withdrew that. But uh, are, are we seeing some, some price target adjustments? Lots of price target adjustments, and I would say not, not favorably either. I mean, there's many that are saying that at least they're taking this step in the right direction. Like I was reading a Jeffrey's note that acknowledged, well, hey, they are at least making progress. It's, it's still not really enough. And several other analysts, RBC was one. I mean, V of A did re- maintain its buy but reduced its price target. I mean, several of these other names, Goldman Sachs, Williams Trading, also cutting their price target, Telsey. So I, I haven't seen really any sort of, you know, strong conviction in the upside. But there are a lot of maintaining of the buy ratings. It's just the price target reductions, too. I think a common the fact that we're not expecting a recovery of at least the anticipated scale anytime soon. Yeah, analysts very split on this name. There are 20 buys and 20 holds and then two sells. So not so much bearish, but uh, very much split between uh, buys and holds. Jenny Horn, holds. Jenny Horn, thanks so much. Thanks, Caroline.